So um, I'm just going to share a bit of background about myself and then talk about what I hope to achieve in this session. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm, I've been practicing Lean Startup for a couple of years now. And uh, I'm also part of a couple of different groups where I mentor a few other companies, startups. Uh, I'm now with Intuit, which is also a much larger company that still works as sort of small teams of startups using both design thinking and Lean Startup. And um, I want to sort of just share some real practical examples of how I've tried to use Lean Startup and some challenges that I've faced. And um, I don't want to be someone here who's coming and trying to give a lot of gyan, because <laughs> I think there's enough gyan out there. <laughs> Um, so I'm hoping I can share some real examples because I think that's kind of where it's valuable and encourage more conversations within our community to talk about sort of what's working for you or what's not working for you and how can we learn from each other. And I think to me if I can incubate some thoughts and get people together here talking about it, figuring out how in the context of Agile and Lean things could work together, that would be great. Uh, I'm not here to evangelize Lean Startup. I think there's some strengths here. There's certain areas where it hasn't worked for me. Ultimately, I think these things are horses for courses. It's design thinking, customer development. I think you sort of got to choose depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but here, I'll talk a little more specifically with respect to Lean Startup, how I've applied it, and certain things that I've learned. So I'm a perpetual entrepreneur, even if I'm a part of a big company, an intrapreneur in a big company. Um, I've, I've been a part of multiple startups in the past. I lived and worked in the Bay Area for a while as a part of one startup that we took public. We grew it globally. Uh, I've held a number of different roles, been a part of taking different products to the market. Uh, I've been both in engineering leadership roles as well as in product leadership roles. And I just love working with small teams to foster innovation and, uh, and help uh, take ideas, you know, ground up. Uh, I've also been a mentor at Lean Startup Machine. And uh, that's sort of where I felt like, hey, it's good to sort of talk about all this, but really sort of sharing examples is useful uh, since we can then really learn a little more from each other. Um, I'll also talk a bit about me as a senior product manager at Intuit in the context of how I know many of you are from much larger companies. And I think a lot of this still applies for you, although the case study that I'm going to share is from a startup that I was a part of earlier. Um, so this is a case study that ended up getting really popular, to popular to the point where it's almost a little embarrassing in some ways. <laughs> but I had people like Benjamin Southwark and you know, Gary Toss, people who I really, really respect, sort of reaching out and saying, hey, this is how you guys should build product. And um, I think it sort of inspired me to say, hey, you know, to look to share more with people, learn more from others too. And I hope that you know, we'll all have opportunities to do that. Uh, I did do a quick show of hands earlier. I kind of got a sense many of you here are exposed to Lean Startup in various ways. Some of you are actively practicing it. A few of you here are looking at design thinking too. Um, so, but since there are people who are new, uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about what Lean Startup is, uh, just a little, and then I'll go on to cover off the case study in a little more in detail, uh, certain surprises that we learned, and a bit about just why I think Lean Startup is hard in practice and how I've struggled with it a little bit. Um, and I welcome feedback and inputs from those who are practitioners as well. So um, I think the first thing I wanted to start off with is to say that you know, Lean is used in a broad context in manufacturing, where Lean is about efficiency. So, but I want to, want you, if for those coming from the manufacturing side of the world, I want you to sort of set that aside for a bit. And uh, you know, Lean Startup is, about translating vision into product. And it's not just about lean from a cost perspective. So that's the first important thing when you think about. It's not about cost savings or trying to run with a really lightweight team and get something done. It's not the cost saving piece, but really about a systematic way of translating vision into product. Uh, there's sort of three pieces to it. Okay. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the business model canvas? Hands, please. Okay, great, perfect. So, um, I'll talk just a little bit about it and then I'll move on. But there's three pieces, business model canvas, customer development, and agile development. And these are sort of the three blocks that sort of work together, and I think of them as tools that sort of bring Lean Startup together overall. I also think of Lean Startup as a methodology. It's important to know that it's not something that's sort of set in stone as a process. It's a way of thinking about how we do things. And um, here's an example of a business model canvas. 
uh, which sort of tries to point out where the different pieces come together. The simplest way that I like to explain it is, think of it as a business plan that's written in a certain way. And it's a business plan that you write in a way in which it makes it easy for you to test out various assumptions that you're making. So for instance, if you're a startup and you're trying to map out various pieces of your business, uh, the customers, your value proposition, acquisition channels. Often I find that startups try to really test the value proposition side really high, but they don't focus on testing the channel first. And I'll talk about why some of these pieces are important in the context of experiments, especially because you end up having multiple control variables, which then become a little hard to manage. So think of this as just a business plan, right? Which is a plan that you can test in various ways and gives you a way of thinking about things in a systematic fashion. The second piece here is customer development, which uh, Steve Blank, uh, who's definitely, I think, one of the people you should read. If you want to read more about customer development, I encourage you to read Steve Blank's blog. Uh, this is a manifesto that he put out. And one fundamental important thing is, look, there are no facts inside your building. You could put a bunch of smart people together who could talk about things. You could argue and debate things from a logical perspective forever, but uh, you've got to talk to real people. You've got to go out and talk to real people to find out the why behind what they do. And there's a certain qualitative aspect to this that becomes really, really important that also has to be supplemented with the quantitative side of what you do. So ultimately, the thing here is you're trying to, the thing is, it's not about how do we do this, right? Because you can always build things. But why should we build what we're doing? Why are we doing what we're doing? And trying to sort of figure out the why that becomes really, really important until it's almost at a deep philosophical level that helps you, gets you passionate about a broader vision about the change that you want to make in the world, right? So avoid surveys is sort of what I'd say. I mean, it's, you know, there's situations where surveys are useful, but I'd encourage you to avoid surveys, get out of the building, talk to real users. Now, I can talk a lot about customer development because there's this systematic approach to how you ask questions and to ensure that you don't ask questions which are leading questions, you don't ask questions which are close-ended, and ensure that you're talking to people who won't hesitate to tell you that you're full of shit if what your idea, the idea that you have is, is bad. And also ways of sort of going about asking questions without revealing your idea, because people ultimately inherently just want to make you happy. So there's a classic, uh, uh, there's a book called The Mom Test, which I'll recommend for those of you who'd like to look it up. Uh, but Rob Fitzpatrick, he's outlined, I think, in a very simple language, different ways in which you should think about how you go about doing customer development and asking questions that I think are very valuable to a lot of people and even how maybe even internally in an organization, when you interact with people about an idea, it's a good way to get feedback. Uh, related to customer development, but different, is design thinking, and I won't delve into that, but I want to point out that ultimately it's sort of horses for courses. These are ultimately different ways of solving problems, and it's, you sort of have to understand these to choose which approach makes sense where, where design thinking comes from a much more of a systems perspective broadly. Uh, I think uh, the way I tend to see customer development is sort of a more lighter weight way of going about seeking early validation. Uh, I think a question that came up in the last session was around lean and agile. And uh, this is a slide from Steve Blank, which, sorry, from, from Eric Ries, which I think is useful. Um, I don't think it completely defines uh, how the two work together, but I think it's a good model to think about, which is, I, I see both as just loops, right? You've got one loop going with your customers at one end, you've got one loop internally. And you're managing two different loops. One loop which sort of answers the question of, What's the problem people have? Why do they have the problem? Why should we build? What should we build, right? And the other loop, which is how should we solve this problem? Is there a better way to solve it? And, and sort of maintaining a tight loop at both ends. And ultimately within your organization, ensuring these loops are in sync, driving communication, fostering that culture of experimentation at both ends uh, to ensure there's sufficient customer focus, qualitative data coming in along with quantitative, combined with that internal cycle of enabling this becomes really important. So I think the two tie in really well. I don't think it's perfect quite yet, but I think you know uh, this is an area where I feel that there's an opportunity for all of us here to see how we can embrace this more, and you know we can talk more about that. One quick thing I want to highlight is remember that to, I think the focus is on learning, right? See, you can run through experiments, and you may uh, something might succeed, something might fail, 
But failure is failure to learn. If you fail to learn, that is failure. If you've learned something about things, about your customers, about needs along the way, that's still success. Okay. So this is an important thing. The focus is on learning, not just running through it. Sure, go ahead. Should not be? Big failure and which, which can doom you basically. Absolutely, you know, it's a great point. I think, you know, like for me, like back in the day, like 10, 15 years back when we would build products, we'd go through the whole big cycle of putting a product out, go through a big bang PR cycle to launch it, and then it's only that fair tail end of the cycle that you really realize how far away you are from market needs. And definitely the focus here is on failing fast in a certain sense, but I have some caveats around this, and I'll talk a bit about that, because failing fast has some downsides where I feel that you end up in certain local maxima. And I'll talk a bit about that too in a bit. So I want to ask you guys, what is an experiment? Anybody? Simulation of a reality mm -hmm. to validate that uh, which is having a known outcome. Great, uh, excellent. Your outcome could be either positive or negative. Or negative, sure. Anyone else? Trying something you don't know. Great, okay. Validating your assumptions, okay. Trial and error, is it? Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Anyone else? Finding out something. Sure. Testing something in a laboratory. Testing something in a laboratory. You know, we, we, a lot of good perspectives. Now, I think different people will like, describe this in certain ways. In the context of lean, I like to think of it as it's a series of tests which help answer a question. And the question is really sort of the hypothesis, which a few people here have mentioned. And the reason this is important to understand this is we end up, as a part of Lean Startup, you end up structuring a number of experiments. Okay? Now these experiments all tie back to help answer certain questions. Now, what are these questions? What are the most important questions? How do you figure out what those most important questions are? Right? And how do you go about doing it? So in the Lean Startup context, the way this is often thought about is there's a leap of faith assumption, which is a number of assumptions that you might be making but there's one that you would identify as being your leap of faith or sort of the most high risk assumption, right? And typically you would start off with your most high risk assumption, craft a hypothesis or a question around that, and then run an experiment to test it out. Okay, and I'll go on to show you guys a few examples, so we'll get into a little more detail. So one myth I want to debunk in case this is out there at all is that Lean Startup is just for startups. Like I mentioned earlier, I work at Intuit. We're a $10 billion market cap company, and we run our product team in pretty small groups. And you know, we focus on design thinking, lean startup experimentation. I'm personally involved in experiments focused on the long tail of small business owners. And we drive innovation at a number of different levels, trying to encourage entrepreneurs and keeping a tight loop between product uh, management and product dev. So with that, I'll go on to a case study which has been shared in the public domain by me as a part of uh, one of the previous startups that I was involved in called Levitum. And it was called Fun with Charades. And uh, these experiments were run a little while back, uh, November 2013 through Feb 2014. So sort of a four month cycle, three to four month cycle where we went through with these. And um, here's kind of where we started off, right? We sort of had a certain vision which is, hey, you know, remember the days when, you know, it was so easy to meet people online, you could connect with them. And now we're all stuck with mainly just our social networks and Facebook, and we meet people sort of in the real world, but the sort of level of online interaction for most young people has sort of gone down. And we were trying to think of teens, college kids, yuppies, casual gamers, as potentially being the target audience that we would look at. And we felt that the problem was there's just sort of a lack of fun options for meeting more people. You remember the days when you sort of had pen pals, you would write to them back and forth, for those who are like as old as I am, you don't remember any of that. <laughs> but uh, that's sort of gone in some ways. And maybe it's a bit of the nostalgia that inspired this a little bit. But the thought was, what if we could you know, create an online community 
as a solution where people would play charades over live video, by either web or mobile, over live video, where someone would be acting out clues and the other people would be guessing. Right? So live video, where people would access, you know, would get onto live video chat, and people are on video, audio is turned off to other people, and they're guessing, and people are responding. So now, you know, as we sort of brainstormed and came up with all this, we were thinking, hey, you know, there's this popular game that got sold for like several millions of dollars and has like millions of people playing Pictionary online. So if people play Pictionary online, would people care to play charades? And dumb charades is popular in India. You know, we think it's popular around the world. It's fairly universal. People understand how to play it. So hey, maybe it's interesting. We were like super excited, right? So, but where do we begin? Right? There's tons of things we could go about. Where should we even start? So, you know, we're practicing lean startups. So we try to just sort of just step back and say, what are some of the high risk assumptions we're making here? And we try to sort of just put a list together and resist our bias towards action and trying to go out and actually build something. <laughs> so I call these the big ifs. Okay, this is not really a lean startup terminology thing, but I try to encourage a team to sort of capture these big ifs. What are the biggest if involved? And have some sort of cadence around what these ifs are. So this is sort of how we structured it. And uh, it's possible there are other ifs involved, but this is what we thought of. Uh, if people are interested in playing charades online, if they are, and if they're comfortable turning on video, right, to play, uh, if they like the concept enough to invite friends or to join a public room, because often, you know, these game rooms either have private rooms or public rooms, and if they enjoy the playing experience with others enough so that they will come back, right? So your retention side of it, thinking of ARRR metrics. And will they, if they invite enough people to sort of create your little viral product loop, then we'll be on to something. Now, we didn't know what that something would be, and you know, we didn't want to bother about monetization and all those fun questions until later. But this is sort of how we framed what we thought were the fundamental pieces of it. Because once you get to a certain level of DAU, MAU, and active usage of product market fit, some of those other options can sort of be worked through. So these were our big ifs, right? Questions that we had in mind. Do people really care about these things? Are people, would people be comfortable turning on video? And you know, um, one challenge obviously within the team, we've got some fantastic like 10X engineers who were like, hey, I can build this in a week. Let's just do it. <laughs> and we had to sort of resist that urge to sort of go through to say, hey, let's go about it systematically you know, and see what we can do. And we started with the very first one, which is do people even care about playing charades online? And um, you know, the experiment hypothesis was of a sampling set of people who are searching for charades online. Right? So people who are already Google searching for charades online we felt that at least 25% of those people who are already searching would click through to come to our page and then would sign up. Now, landing pages don't always tell you a whole lot. I think the, mostly what they tell you is that people understand what you're doing. <laughs> so there's a bit of a caveat there. But at least it's an initial signal with respect to the first piece of it. So this is pretty much what we did. We ran a Google ad which went to a fairly crappy page. This is a mock-up, but the page looked worse than this. <laughs> it looked pretty bad, right? So we ran an ad with like just a few hundred rupees and targeted people who were looking to play charades online. And we had more than 25 people coming and signing up on a pretty crappy page that had like nothing on it. <laughs> so we were like, hey, okay. So at least there's an interest in playing you know, charades online among those who Google for it. That's all we know. You can't really infer more than that. So one part is you've got to be honest with yourself. You can't really extrapolate a whole lot here. This is all you can learn from this. Right? So but from here, we went on to the second hypothesis we had, which was to sort of, sorry, it's still the first hypothesis, but trying to collect a little more qualitative feedback. So uh, here is where we sort of built out the second MVP. Uh, which is to sort of run another experiment where we spoke to people within the friends network to walk them through mock-ups of what the flow would be like and collect feedback. And while collecting feedback, and this is sort of an important one, we essentially asked them the question about 
how disappointed would you be if we didn't build this, if we dropped the idea? How disappointed would you be? So the question to ask is not, do you like it, do you not like it? Oh, yeah, we like it, of course. You can let me know later, we'll check it out. Never happens, right? So we actually asked him, how disappointed would you be, which is a fairly harsh test. And uh, the, the good thing was, at least, and, and keep in mind, there's a bit of bias here because these people are through the friends network, okay? There's a bit of bias that is induced. But feedback was unanimously positive. One little flag was a few people mentioned that they may be comfortable being, and maybe uncomfortable, being on video online. Okay, so there's a bit of a flag which ties into one of the other assumptions we had made about people being comfortable being on online. So this is what the wireframes look like. This is the initial MVP. Also keep in mind, like I think uh, Naresh pointed out, an MVP is almost always more minimal than you think it is, or it, you think it needs to be. So you have to almost keep thinking hard to see what am I really trying to answer the question for? And can I think of something that's a, a simpler, lighter, quicker way of getting that early sort of coarse granular validation? Keep in mind that the coarse granular validation, when you expand out to a larger data set, might change. Right? So these are the wireframes, and feedback was largely positive. Right? Like I said, I think we spoke to about 20, 30 people, and more than 85, 90% of them felt they'd be very disappointed. And they're like, if I had it now, I would right away start playing and inviting people. So we noted as well that a few people were, had concerns about turning video on, right? And they were like, if I turn video on, will that be something only my friends can see, or would it be in public? Uh, I'll talk a little more about this earlier, but we grappled with this thing of, for us to scale a business around this and get some real numbers, we had to think of public game rooms, because private game rooms have the ghost town challenge of like Google Wave. You go in their private room and you don't have anyone to wave to, you don't have anyone to play with, and then there's abandonment. So we wanted to start with public and find a core group of early adopters who really, really cared about it and then grow it. So we wanted to focus on public first, right? Now, we went back to the people who had signed up on the Google Ads page and reached out to them to come and invite people to the public room and join people, and we tracked analytics through the course of this. And uh, as we went through this, we had decent screens at this point, you know, so was a little more, we spent some amount of work on design, putting a little flow together where people would come in, and then they would need to turn on video, and the little prompt comes up in the browser. Now, <laughs> we were, we, you know, so here's a surprise, right? We were hoping that at least 20% would respond, but less than 5% turned on video in the public room. Okay. Now, we could have followed up with other hypotheses, like saying if the, if the design was better, that conversion rate would improve. But then we really wanted a much stronger signal, because sure, design can improve it maybe a little bit, five to seven, seven to 10, but we're looking for a much stronger signal here. So we kind of had to step back to the drawing board and dig into this a little more. So we tested a few pieces out then. We're like, okay, if there's concerns around uh, being on video in public, how would people feel about playing with friends in that context? And uh, so we ran a couple of tests, and I'll walk you through them. One part of it was friends of friends, so a little one step further removed. Still some bias, but a little less, right? And we ran tests where we invited them into a uh, sort of a setup where they were at our places, and a few were out in like their own homes, and trying to play from different locations and to see how they responded to the flow and how they started to go through and play. We didn't actually build out the whole app at that point, but video was there, so people could be on online video together, and there were instructions where with video, they had to sort of figure out how to play and do it themselves. Right? So pretty much think of it like a Skype video call <laughs> for all practical purposes. Now, here's sort of the offline side of the validation, which is running it live with various people. And, uh, 80 to 90% of them felt very positive, were super excited, wanted to come back and play again, wanted to get in touch with all the other people they didn't know and connect with them. The positive offline validation, we had people in the age group 20 to 30 as well as a bunch of like school and college kids who were like 15 to 20. Okay. Uh, again, keep in mind like India doesn't have COPA laws, so some things doing some of that was a little simpler as well for us to run through here. Um, now, after we saw that people were comfortable with friends, we were hitting a bit of a roadblock. Like, we could have pursued the friends path, but we hesitated. Right? So we stepped back to the thing of what can we do to get a core group of people who would be comfortable doing this in public? And so we were thinking and scratching our heads really hard, saying, 
how do we find early adopters? Who are the people who really care? Who are the people who would be comfortable being on video online with strangers? And after thinking about it for a while, we, you know, getting a little creative, we were like, you know, there are the sex chat groups online. So let's look at the sex chat communities of people who See, even, uh, so I'll, I'll answer that quickly. So uh, as we interviewed the people who were comfortable with friends of friends, uh, there was still a certain context that they felt comfortable in. There are a few people who are still like, yeah, I might play with people, but I'll have to see. But we didn't get a strong signal. The thing was still like, I would prefer to play with friends. And uh, some of the guys were like, yeah, I don't mind being on video with strangers. But overall, the signal wasn't strong. So we felt that uh, it would still be a little hard, and we wanted to test this out a little further. The other thing, too, is if you remember the past experiment, right? we actually had data showing that people had come in and were not comfortable getting on to video with people. So we had data. So we wanted to test this a little further to get a core group of people who cared. So um, the chat really and chat random communities, sex chat communities, the people who are comfortable being nude on video through most of the day with a whole bunch of different strangers, right? So we ran Google Ads trying to acquire these guys, and we offered a completely anonymous experience in a public room. So they didn't have to sign up. They could come in. They could play. And uh, we added a qual I don't know if you get familiar with qual but you but know, a little tool to try to gain insights on why they don't turn it on. So the numbers went up, right? So we had more people who were turning it on, right? And we had people who were sharing it publicly too. So these people were inviting people publicly, saying, hey, come on in and join me to play charades. So it was good, but still the numbers we felt were not high enough, right? So there was a huge bump in the numbers, but the numbers weren't high enough. So this is kind of where we grappled with this public-private question, because the public rooms it's, you know, it's important because we want to get to the critical mass of core active users and then grow DAU, MAU from there. But family and friends are not comfortable. Private rooms has a ghost town challenge, similar to Google Wave. And the real-time game also poses scheduling issues. The sort of scheduling issues you have with a private room is, I get on, I check this out, I invite you to say, hey, come join me. You see it two hours later, and by the time I'm gone. So to figure out a time that works for different people who are friends is pretty hard. Because in the real world, you know, we meet here, we play charades together. But to get that time sync was proving to be a challenge. People we spoke to, we got a sense that wouldn't work. We considered an async flow via a mobile app. And we tested a few experiments around it. But there were experience issues which were causing friction. And for the guy who's got to act it out, where does he keep the phone? Is he comfortable putting it up there and doing it? And there were a few other experience issues we were grappling with that made it a little hard. So, there were a few other surprises we learned, too. <laughs> and this is one which was like, oh, OK, this is interesting. But charades is just played very differently in India. Uh, in, in India, it's very technical, it's very geeky, it's very competitive. It's played in colleges. People form their own clubs. They've got all these alphabetical codes to do things. Uh, but the data we got is, at least in the US, Canada, most of the parts of the world, it's a very simple, much more simpler version of the game. And it's very family oriented and it's played around the holidays, around Thanksgiving, around Christmas. So just a very different context, very different thought process, very different approach altogether. Uh, we discovered that there was potential for tools to enable offline versions of charades. So for people who are playing offline, tools that will give them word suggestions, tools that will give them you know, ideas on how to coordinate it among a group of friends. Though we discovered this, we didn't pursue it. But what happened later is, interestingly, there's a popular app called Heads Up Charades, an iPhone app which you sort of hold up in front of your head and play, which came after this, which actually pursued the idea quite successfully, popularized as well by a TV show which happened around then. Um, and so we learned that there's interest in charades. It's not a weak signal, but it's not a strong signal either. And we were a little ambivalent here, because one of the classic problems with startups is you'll hear a lot of them talking about, we're working on a growth hypothesis. We're trying to grow from this stage. And there are many of them stuck in what I think one of my friends, Rajan, he calls it the happy, confused state. We've got a certain number of active users. Some people are willing to pay. Some people who are using it regularly. You're unable to grow that number. 
And often that hard question you've got to ask yourself is, do, you think, do I think if I keep spending time, this will grow? Am I really onto something that's big enough? Is this a big enough problem for me to go after? Or am I just fooling myself into thinking like I can persevere on? And that's hard. It's that question of should I pivot, should I not? Is this sort of a broader pivot? What sort of a pivot is it? And it sort of is hard, right? But uh, at, at least at a certain level, you've got to be honest with yourself when certain things happen. And we made a choice at that stage saying, hey, uh, we'd like to pivot away to try some other things. There's certain things I think we did well, but certain things which I don't think we did too well, and there were good learnings there. I think we captured our thought process well, uh, listed out the assumptions, laid out hypothesis well. I think we found small batches that we were able to go through and prove or disprove, and run quick, lightweight experiments on the Agile side. And uh, I think we stayed relatively honest and objective. We tracked metrics, we tracked cohorts, we did the diligence going through it in a systematic, objective way. Um, what we didn't do well, and these were some learnings, uh, you're trying to build a product for a global audience, it's a perpetually a challenge doing it from India, right? Because if your target audience is global, and you're trying to look at a global audience, and let me answer the question about why global. Uh, um, see, back then, 4G hadn't come to India, so data was still not great. And a number of people with Wi-Fi in the target audience of young people was still low. So we felt that the India play was too early, and we had to achieve something in a global space before later coming back to India. But getting qualitative feedback sitting here as a startup was a little difficult, because to reach out to people in the US to be willing to get, get them to spend time. Now, I'm at Intuit now, in a bigger company with much more resources where we actually have at Intuit a team that's dedicated to like, recruiting people we can talk to. But as a startup, we didn't have the liberty. It was really hard. So we had to sort of find people we had access to, which was local. And these were not representative of our target audience. Second, we pivoted away from our original vision. You know? And a lot of feedback that I got after the blog post was popular on Hacker News. A number of people reached out saying, hey, your original vision is good. Why didn't you stay true to it? Because charades need not have been the answer. There could have been other solutions to have achieved it. And I think that's something which we could have stayed true to in other ways. Um, third little thing, you know, we added inline surveys later to look at abandonment, but we could have potentially done that sooner. Because one challenge is if we can't talk to people from here in India, especially the anonymous users, those inline surveys like Qualdru could have given us some insights on why are you leaving? Are you going to come back later? Is it because you want to invite a friend? You know, some of those questions where you just don't know why. And how do you figure out the why when you're sitting here in India and trying to target a global user base? It's a little hard. Um, so with this, I'm going to touch upon, I think I've got another 15 minutes. I'll go through this a little quickly, and maybe we can talk about this offline. I want to talk a little bit about why I feel Lean Startup is a bit hard in practice. And for certain types of things, I think it's useful. Certain other types, it's not. Um, first off, I think just experiment design is hard. I've mentored a number of other startups, a Lean Startup machine and other groups. Crafting a hypothesis is hard. It takes a certain discipline to sort of just go through to figure out what your leap of faith assumptions are. Uh, while this is hard, this is not a bad thing. It's hard, but it's not a bad thing. This is a good thing. Now, second is, we talk about experimentation and we feel good. Hey, I'm like a scientist. Sure. <laughs> but scientists, like many of you pointed out earlier, run experiments in a controlled environment where they can manage control variables. And you can run experiment batches with a certain level of rigor and persistence. Here, it's out on the internet, right? Different groups, different variables. <laughs> It's, it's hard, it's hard. So to run these while understanding what are the control variables which are in flux and trying to manage them uh, requires rigor and patience. Um, both rigor and patience are important. See, lean startup can be a little frustrating when working with an agile team. You've got developers who want to quickly build something and go through cycles. And you're like, hey, no, 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 we don't want to build it until this is really validated. And sometimes it's a little frustrating. While it's not necessarily orthogonal, like I think someone has mentioned, whereas uh, Agile has been incorporated a number of these ideas in certain ways or the other in the past. Uh, not completely new, but it's still a, it's a sort of a point of friction to just keep in mind, which is a rigor and persistence and are both needed. Third is, you know, you need decent sampling sizes to really draw any inference. You know, you can talk to 10 people and, and infer something. Uh, you can have 100 people come to the site and infer something can't always extrapolate that. So the sampling sizes start to get important. And how, 
how do you know what the right sampling size is? There are scientific approaches to doing it, but in practice, what do you do? It's a little hard. <laughs> um, you know, I think our, our understanding of cognitive psychology, I think, is still evolving. I mean, you know, I, I'll be honest, I think I'm still learning here. And to design some of these experiments in a way which leverages some of those learnings becomes really important because you've got a small experiment and little things here completely change how people respond. And I think this is a very important piece. I'm still learning here. I'm looking for more people that I can connect with so I can learn more about this. Uh, I think the other challenge of Lean Startup is I feel that certain commercial opportunities may not emerge from clear problems. And I kind of feel like, you know, if you take an example of some guy is about to, of how Flipboard came out when Google Reader was already there, and there were a number of other popular apps that already solved the problem. Flipboard was widely popular, but sometimes I, I, I struggle personally a little bit to see whether Lean Startup would help surface those sort of opportunities, which could also be big. So it's, it's, this is not to sort of uh, say that Lean Startup is bad, but to say that you sort of got to choose it for certain types of problems. Um, so I think the other part, too, is getting caught in local maxima. And I think a number of people have spoken about this, Peter Thiel, you know, in zero to one, a few other things. But, you know, uh, often with Lean Startup, you're sort of iterating away in a certain focus area. And sometimes you've got to sort of look at sort of a broader, bigger vision which you want to go after. And sometimes you get caught in the local maxima, a little caught in the weeds a little bit. Uh, I think this is a valid concern. I've heard it from a number of people. I'd be open to ideas from those of you who have gone through this to see how you think about it. And finally, it's sort of this you know, balance between bias towards action and bias towards reflection. And I think both are so important because you know, big company, small company, you need to have enough space for reflection. And um, reflection is important to draw insights, to take the time to think. But there's also a bias towards action to go through those cycles quickly. And it's a tricky balance. I, I personally struggle with this a little bit. Uh, some of the entrepreneurs I've spoken to have. So this is just a quick summary of some of that, the points we just covered off. Um, so <laughs> what happened it was um, after I made the blog post, um, and I shared it in a couple of the lean startup groups that I was a part of, um, one of the guys I respect, his name is Sean Murphy, he's one of the Lean Startup consultants. He liked it, he picked it up, and he shared it on Hacker News. And I think it was like a Sunday morning, I was going out somewhere with my wife, and I was like, damn, all these people are commenting on my blog and sending me tweets. I wonder what's happening. <laughs> I later looked at the analytics, and I realized that I was on page one of Hacker News. And one day I had like 20,000 visitors, <laughs> which is probably like 20 times how much any of the other posts on my blog have. <laughs> And I had people whom I respect uh, a lot, like Benjamin Southworth and um, Gary, who's in the, he's a board member at Hootsuite, saying that, hey, I'm going to use this as an example of how you should do a startup. And this is great to see someone practicing lean successfully. And this is how you should practice lean. And Rajan talking about how, on this side of the world, this is probably the best application of lean rigorous that I've seen. And uh, you know, I'm like, oh, I just wish this had been something which we had you know, had the way to sort of take it further. So, because we were sort of on the downslope of time, we're invalidated. I'm sort of happy that we learned a lot out of it and didn't waste more time than we needed to. And we failed fast, if you will. But there are all those trade offs, and it's always slightly confusing when you have multiple ways you could go about doing things. So, um, that's mostly what I had. And if any of you are looking to apply a lean startup to a new idea, either in small company, big company, like I mentioned, I'm now a senior product manager with Intuit, where I'm a part of a team that's looking at long-term innovation and running experiments. I'd love to talk to you and uh, happy to sort of share different things that we're doing so we can all learn from each other. I'm also on Twitter and my blogs if you want to connect. Uh, I think we have, I'll just do a quick time check. Uh, I think we have got time for questions. Yeah, 10 minutes, so sure. Sure. Who's next after this? Yeah, got it. So the, uh, so the question is about the uh, example you mentioned about the Flipboard and uh, missing uh, commercial opportunities. Yeah. So basically, uh, I mean, in what situation would you like to use Lean Startup and when not? So do you have a kind of idea about that? Yeah, I mean, see, this is my opinion at this point. So I feel that I found, in, among other entrepreneurs too, that Lean Startup has worked well 
where we're able to find sort of a strong signal for a problem that exists. But in cases where a strong signal for a problem uh, may not, there's no strong signal for a problem. Like, you know, like, to me, I thought of the Flipboard example because if I spoke to 20, 30 people who use Google Reader or one of the other dozen, couple of dozen apps out there, I don't know whether Lean Startup would have helped surface that. Potentially, design thinking might have because I think with design thinking, just how you immerse yourself with just the user, the behaviors, think about it from a systems perspective, something might have emerged. So I may think more design thinking there if you have the luxury to go through the cycle and have the resources to go through that completely. So, so what you're trying to say is that if the problem statement, statement is very clear, then yeah. you may try to go through the design thinking. Is, is that what you're saying? Or? Uh, is it, I, I mean, see, I don't think customers will ever, will ever tell you exactly what the problem is. So even with Lean Startup, you you know, there's a certain aspect of qualitative analysis where you still want to sort of understand what they say, but also think about what they do, what they think, what they feel, and all four are related. But um, but but definitely, if if if, if the signal is not strong, with lean startup, you're more likely in those experiments to sort of pivot away and move on because you're running very short cycles, trying to go through it very quickly, and you don't have a lot of data and tools, and don't have the time to do all that diligence. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think the vision's still there. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, I think you had a question, sure. See, uh, what happens when the MVP fails? So um, it's uh, success and failure are a part of it, right? So you run an experiment, and if it succeeds or fails, you treat both the same. Right? Important thing is what you learn from it, right? Now, uh, suppose you succeed. Then you move from the last leap of faith assumption you made to the next highest leap of faith assumption. So suppose this was your biggest high risk assumption up here. You start with an experiment there. If this, if this succeeded, you move on to the next high risk assumption to test that out. Now, if you got invalidated, that's sort of when you've got to sort of think about, should I pivot away or should I persevere around? Uh, this helped, uh, there's a lot more context here. I'll maybe talk to you offline a little more about that. So sure. So really the answer is as short as possible. So literally think in terms of days, not weeks. And uh, work in a really tight loop. It, some of it comes down to sort of the channels that you have for acquisition and your ability to turn things around quickly to learn from those users. So think days, not weeks. Uh, Arvi, yeah. uh, another question is the, the entire experiment uh, surrounded around the solution uh, rather than the problem statement. Could, could you, could you uh, the that? entire hypothesis questions yeah. uh, were uh, surrounded on the, the, the carrots as a fun option. Yeah. Playing the carrots as a fun option, not on the problem statement. You wanted mm -hmm. to look at the fun options but uh, when we went through as a solution, the first mm. as the carrots, mm. and then you went through all of your hypothesis with these mm. carrots only. Why, why, I mean, where we surrendered at the solution, not at the problem yeah. Isn't yeah. This is where I was kind of. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree with you, this was a learning. So <coughs> sort of in places where we apply Lean Startup later, we refined our approach, where we try to step away to not just look at the solution aspect of it, but to look at the problem and the vision a little more closely. So that was definitely a learning, the part of the cycle, to not lose sight of the vision and the problem that we were trying to solve. I agree with you completely. Can you, can you give an example of local maxima that kind of got you trapped in a local maxima kind of uh, example? Um, I don't think I have an example here. Uh, I'll have to think a bit about other public examples that I can share, if not from my experience. But um, I can answer this offline. I just want to give it a bit of thought to make sure I'm framing it right. So, sure. Yeah. Would you say if the signal is not strong enough, pivot away? If the signal is not strong enough, pivot on it? Uh, not necessarily. It will depend a little bit. So the pivot question is a little hard. So see, uh, like I said, most of the experiments you, sh you saw here, 
we're testing the value hypothesis, right? Now, if you go back to the business model canvas, there are other things to test as well. So you might want to consider whether you want to test other channels, other channels of acquiring users. You want, might want to think about, are you really going after the right personas of people? What is the personas you have in mind? So I think it kind of depends a little bit. Um, there's a lot of jargon that gets tossed around, like people will talk about zoom in pivot, zoom out pivot, customer pivot, different variant terms. All of it pretty much comes down to, hey, you experiment might have failed in this context. And a little bit of it is a judgment call still at this point. It's a bit of a judgment call that you as a leader need to make saying, hey, uh, this didn't work out. Maybe a broader sampling size, do I want to test that? Do I want to test with a completely different audience? Um, do I want to test it out with a different set of in incentives? And I'll give you some examples, like right now some of the experiments are running are platform experiments, you know, ecosystem marketplace type experiments where I've got multiple types of users, one set contributing, another one consuming. So I have to run these experiments separately with different groups, but behavioral characteristics are very, very different. And I'm looking at long tail where there are a lot of different variances involved. So I have to run various experiments before I can sort of figure out if it is right to pivot or not. And in, in certain long tail cases, they may not be a strong signal. It might be a moderate signal too. You know? So I think it kind of depends. If you're looking at a utility tool, for instance, I think you may want to look for a slightly stronger signal. And part of the reason too why you may want to look for a stronger signal is sometimes you want to start off with a group of early adopters. It doesn't mean that you won't get to the point where those people with a more moderate signal may come on board, but you need to start off with, you, you definitely want to start off with your ideal customer. Think of who your ideal customer is, what that persona is like, where he lives, what he breathes, what he eats, what he does, what his life is like, what he cares about, and figure out how to go and find them. You might find that your hypothesis is wrong, and then you need to think of who else maybe is the right one. So there's a bit of subjectivity, which also makes this whole process a little bit hard because it's, we can say it's scientific, but it's not completely objective in my opinion. So. <laughs> yeah, so I think, see, in the context of this, this is a startup, so it is a fairly small team, like less than 10 people. Uh, in my current role here, we've got a larger team, right? So literally, there's like teams of uh, 30, 40 people around it. Now, the team that might actually be involved in running the experiments was still small, <laughs> even in a big company. So largely, you look at, uh, you've got to think of the PD team, the, the, the engineering team, uh, are people who are comfortable with this sort of experimentation, right? Um, typically, if you've got guys who want to spend a lot of time polishing things and getting things right, um, it'll be a little harder for them because they would want to take a lot more time to build it out. And the opportunities to sort of accrue your technical debt or engineering debt, questions will start to also get in the way of their personal aspirations and career motivations. So I think figuring out people who think, who maybe want to be an entrepreneur someday, you know, who have such ideas and recognize that, hey, it's, it's about working in small groups to try things out, that there is a pot of gold somewhere at the end of that rainbow, but chances are low. And we are doing a number of things which are very experimental, very innovative. Chances of failure are high. I feel that that's the piece of it. Think of a sm Sorry? At, 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 at uh, my current, at Intuit? Are, are you talking about the audience uh, who we experiment? The team who built it, um, yeah, largely through people we knew, mostly, yeah. That definitely drove greater collaboration and became to work in sync, but we had one person who was not connected at all. So, yeah. I don't know if that helps. Maybe I can take it offline. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the problem first and then the solution. Hypothesis stands true. Yeah. Then you would still hypothesize the the problem statement, right? So the both have their own importance. Is what yeah. Uh, you definitely hypothesize the problem part first, right? And then go on to run your experiments on the solution part. So, so in this particular thing, uh, was enough importance done or already 
you know, paid to uh, hypothesize the vision that you had or the problem statement or? Uh, the problem statement, yes, at okay. the broad level, mostly qualitative data talking to a number of people. Right. Uh, we spoke to like tons, like more than 50. Okay, uh, so people agreed that that's a problem and then it yeah. began to hypothesize in the solution. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But what we didn't do, which I think is a valid point, is tie things back to the problem. Tying it back to Tying the... It back. We, we didn't do okay. that later, which, we, you know, which was a learning and a, since embraced that a lot more to keep that So in probably mind. always validating the vision with each of the hypotheses, that to solution Yeah, to keep uh, it in mind. And to keep yeah. in mind when you're pivoting, that you could pivot away to something else that still solves the problem or works towards that vision. Mm, precisely. You yeah. know? So, um, but yeah, start with the problem and then on to the solution. Right. Oh, thanks. Uh, there's a question there? Sure. Who's next? Okay, I'll let her finish. To park the problem, uh, see there wasn't competition as much as there was another player. So really, it's it Zynga's draw something, right? Zynga's draw something. Zynga had acquired a company called OMG Pop, which had built it for like 300 or 400 million dollars, right? And draw something was widely popular, and they had both a web sort of live dictionary flow as well as an async model where people could play with the app. So there were a few reference points where similar things had succeeded. Uh, now, this wasn't necessarily, we didn't see, I don't think, at least may I tend to think about it, that I don't worry about competition. I feel that distracts you in a certain. Yeah, no, it is, but if I have, I, I try to validate, I, I think the thing is I, I try to validate it by looking for customer pain. And if that's there, I go from it. Now, I think it's useful to understand why others may not have succeeded or why no one else has done it. People have tried it and failed. Um, but for me personally, I feel that it's important to not get too bothered by that. Like for instance, you could build something, someone could be copying you. How much should you bother about them? I'd rather focus on innovation, focus on driving my thing forward and not worry about competitors. That's at least my <laughs> perspective on that. Um, I think you brought, you said one thing, which is, uh, did I answer your question fully? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. How much did it cost? Uh, sorry? How much money did you burn? Uh, so essentially, we had uh, we went through a period of four months, and mostly it was two people working on it. Mm -hmm. Most of the period was two people working on it. In between, there were others who were involved, but pretty much two people. So uh, I pretty much built most of the web app myself. So I'm pretty I'm I'm quite hands-on, I actually built iOS apps, Android apps, and web. So I built most of it myself with getting help from another team member to build out some of the other pieces. So, so yeah, fairly light, small team going through most of the pieces that we want. You might not be uh, so, comf you, you might be comfortable with the idea of sharing your, the, the product, right, with your friends of friends or something. But do you really suggest that people should validate the idea with, with the community that they know? Because the idea can get stolen as well, right? Yeah, so I, this is a common question that I think I hear from entrepreneurs about uh, protecting your idea. Um, see, at least the current thinking that most people have is, I'm sure your idea is good. I'm sure your idea is valuable. Now, um, if someone else, if, if you really are onto something very, very, very unique, okay, uh, then maybe you want to do it in some cover of secrecy for certain reasons. But in most cases, what I've seen with entrepreneurs is those are ideas which are good, but it's still not something most of the people would care about. Care I know this is hard to accept. It? It, I know it's hard to accept, but most of the other bigger companies out there would still most likely not either have the time or focus to go after that. If you think about it, most often that's the case. Now, I'll give you a, a little example for you to just chew on. Think of Google. How much has Google innovated in the last five years? Pretty much every innovation you think of, even though you think of Google as an innovative company, has come through an acquisition. YouTube came through an acquisition. Right? Android came through an acquisition. Self-driving cars came through an acquisition. <laughs> so,
So don't worry about the big companies, at least in the space. But if you are a big company, right, then you've really got to think of innovation because you want to get ahead of the small guys who are able to innovate much better than you do. What about your peers who are also into the market and they also want to build something else, right? Yeah, I think we can take this offline. I have certain views uh, on competition. So, so your so philosophy to fund it or your philosophy to approach for funding, I'm here. Ah, uh, is that also, uh, does Lean Startup also have some, you know, uh, a way to, uh, to do that? Or, or that's generic across any, any approach that you take? Uh, I'm not aware of uh, the thought process on that. I can, I can check and get back to you from others, but okay. I'm not. See, the business model canvas has things that you can test out with respect to monetization, revenue, and some of those pieces. Okay. Uh, I'm not aware. I'll have to ask and find out. I, I don't have an answer. Okay. I don't know if anyone else does, but please, sure. Uh, examples, uh, I think even this to me was a good example <laughs> where I think, um, like, I'll give you an example. Like, you know, early 2000s, I was a part of the Valley, a couple of different startups there where we built products. And if we had gone about doing this, uh, and even back then, we were quite agile. I mean, we worked through small cycles, but the sort of refinement of thinking of why are we building this? Do people really need it? Who needs it? Was not there. We sort of had the engineering side of it, which is, oh yeah, to build it, to go through the quick cycles, to build it out, but um, that refinement wasn't there. So the question is more on anything that, that was fairly successful and it really saw, the, it saw its day. Yeah. Uh, so such an example where it became a huge success. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't think there are good examples. To be co completely honest with you, I don't think there are good examples. People will tell you that there are examples. Okay. I don't completely believe them yet. Uh, I think this whole space and this thought process around how do we do this is still maturing. Right? We're part of, you know, fortunate to be part of a you know, growing community that's trying to solve for this. It's still not great. Uh, what I'll say is that people have succeeded and then said, oh, yeah, I use Lean Startup. <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not as sure. There are some examples of people, but I, I wouldn't quote them quite yet. I'm not, yeah. So as examples, right, in Buffer, uh, Joel at Buffer has blogged about things he has done, and I think they've achieved a good, you know, success. Um, but I don't quite know sort of what happened when, <laughs> because sometimes people, to be completely candid, people will latch onto it and say, hey, I, I did Lean Startup. This is a bit of a buzzword almost now. So we've got to move beyond those buzzwords, share what we do openly between each other, and think of this as ways where we can constructively help each other to refine how we think about why we do what we do and to build good products through that. You know? And we have a great opportunity sitting here in India to drive such innovation. Uh, hopefully, we'll all be a part of that. Yeah. Right, sorry. Last question? Sure. Yeah. What do you think, uh, what are the challenges uh, when it comes to execution or what traits we should have in the execution that, you know, uh, that it becomes successful? See, I think an open, honest mind. Be as un unassuming as possible. Try to recognize your biases. And within your team, try to play off against the biases so that uh, you look out for each other's biases without getting into groupthink, because groupthink too is not good. Uh, I think that's one. So really a learning mindset, being willing to learn uh, on the other hand, uh, by that bias towards action versus bias towards reflection, uh, it's important. You're a startup or you're a small innovation team. You've got to be scrappy. You've got to do things in a fairly rapid way to try to get to the crux of some of these problems. Because you can't run a research team that's going to go through like a couple of years in a very academic way. The answer is not to move to a very academic model. So to still things, run things in a fairly light, somewhat scrappy way, but to still have a slightly more refined thought process around why you're doing it so that you're learning along the way. So to me, it's that willingness to sort of question why are we doing this, to challenge some of those assumptions, and to, and to have a little bit of creativity in crafting lightweight experiments, and to have the discipline and rigor to test out uh, things while managing some of those control variables. So for instance, um, there's no point if you run one experiment with like you're doing an A-B test with two different completely groups of people where the characteristics are so different, you're comparing apples and oranges. 
So did it validate or invalidate? How do you know? So within an experiment, you've got to test with multiple batches and play around with those control variables a little bit. So it's a combination of a few different things. I, it's a little hard to pin down. But I, to me, uh, being honest with yourself, trying to stay objective, learn from each other, and having a tight, rapid loop is uh, sort of a must. Yes. I think we're done. I might, I'm around, and you guys are my contact. Thank you.